a stream. <laughs> That's the problem. Hello, hello. Microphones. Yeah, you can hear. Unfortunately, I guess that this is another stream. Yeah. Okay, we're getting there. Maybe just don't touch it. <laughs> Just get everyone over here and then we can go. Very sorry, Adam. We have Ben with us. We have Ben with us. Maybe delete the old broken link. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin it. Okay. Right. Is it this one? So you've got three live going? No. Not really. Um, I'm not. Yeah. We've got one that's planned. Can you hear us and see us here, Phil? That's what I'm hoping. Okay, <laughs> you can, good, right. Um, I think we should start by having lost large amounts of our audience to our slight technical incompetence. Yeah. But we'll end up with the stream and we'll end up with some people in the room and we will have a recording um, that um, can be used afterwards. Okay, oh, people are arriving, okay. Um, my apologies for us being late. We're back in the IHR for the first time in two years, and um, our ability to run a live stream has has changed seemingly based on how YouTube has changed since then. So apologies. Um, it's my enormous pleasure um, to introduce for the second time 
um, Dr. Adam Crimble, who is um, a historian, one of the founding members of the Programming Historian, um, is one of our alumni convener of the IHR Digital History Seminar, um, and last year published Technology and the Historian, which um, is a book that certainly I've been recommending to people, and which makes, I think, some really interesting and important arguments about the ways in which history and digital history was founded on the basis of a certain set of factors and not necessarily on a number of origin myths that are, exist within digital humanities and has my favorite appendix to a book. Um, well, a glossary, I guess, but favorite appendix to a book I've come across over the last few years. Um, Adam will be speaking to us today about um, transatlantic digital humanities and thinking about the spatial turn and has added in this bit as viewed from London, which I guess links to that. Um, and I'll hand over to Adam. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, um, James, and thank you uh, for inviting me. This is my first time giving a live paper in two years as well, so I'll do my best. But um, yeah, thank you for having me back to the seminar. And uh, I also wanted to, if I may, I wanted to thank Richard Deswart, or Canadian Richard, as he used for his Twitter handle. Um, Richard was one of the seminar's founding conveners, and sadly he passed away over the summer and he is much missed. And like myself, he was a transatlantic digital historian. Uh, he had experience of the higher education system on both sides of the Atlantic, so Canada and the United Kingdom in both of our cases. And I uh, recall he had a slightly muddled accent to prove that. And this cross-cultural experience is the one that I wanted to talk to you about today, in particular in the context of digital history scholarship because I think it's important, and I think at the moment, it's really something you only get to understand if you're either a global collaborator or if you've migrated across systems by physically uprooting yourself and then having to kind of struggle with the local realities of how things are perhaps different than you might have done previously or that you might have expected. So what I'm hoping to do today is to create a little bit of space where we can talk about the importance of where in digital history or in digital humanities because where you work affects how you work and thus what you create or what problems that you try to solve. Now, Rupika Rassam calls this the digital humanities accent and that's a term that I have found very helpful in thinking about my own work and teaching. James, would you mind hitting the slide? So um, I'm sure people have noticed these accents long before I did, but I grew up in North America, and as I'm sure many of you already know, we in North America tend to take it as red, that our experiences and ideas are the standard upon which all else should be measured. And I don't think we do that in a kind of an arrogant, we're the center of the world kind of a way. Uh, it's just more that we've never really experienced anything else from um, but what we get from within our own echo chamber. Um, and of course, I'm sure there's a good German word for that, but as a North American, I never learned German. Now, one of the effects of this on digital humanities scholarship, at least in English, uh, has for decades been books that at least outwardly don't really show an awareness of their where, or at least they don't center it to the reader. They don't stress how where the book was written might affect what it has to say. And I've put an example here on the screen. So Digital History, A Guide to Gathering, Preserving, and Presenting the Past on the Web, which was published by Dan Cohen and Roy Rosenzweig back in 2005. And this has been a really influential um, book and an analysis that I did of 130 digital history syllabi. This was comfortably the most assigned piece of reading in the field. And I think it's worth noting that both of the authors are American. They give lots of American examples in the book, but there's no suggestion that it's a cultural relic of American thinking or the American higher education system and its pressures to perform in specific ways. It doesn't, for example, align with current thinking in indigenous digital humanities with its ideas of traditional knowledge and control over access to information rather than the knowledge wants to be free philosophy in many cultures. Uh, at present. And I should say, I don't mean this as a criticism of the authors, um, because that book was incredibly useful for a lot of people. It even helped inspire the work that would turn into the programming historian, which a generation later still captures much of my own time. 
Instead, this is an observation that when Americans, and yes, I am picking a little bit on Americans here, and I hope they'll forgive me for that, but when Americans write books about digital humanities, it doesn't seem to occur to them that they should include American or in America in the title. Instead, outwardly, the book is presented as a global solution. And this is probably at least in part because many of us have come to believe that tech is location independent, even if it's designed in specific places such as San Francisco, Seoul, or Tokyo. Just like physics, we're all affected by it equally, or are we? The drive towards global standards helped embed this belief. For example, we had TEI, the Text, en Text Encoding Initiative, which is a celebration of standard and interoperable markup. We have HTML in the languages of the web, which are designed to work anywhere on earth. We have UTF-8, which made different character sets viable in computers, opening up textual analysis to people no matter what language they were writing in. And even the hardware started to standardize. So we all know what button to push on a VCR or an iPod to get it to play, pause, or rewind. So maybe location doesn't matter. Next slide, please. And the bookshelf in English language digital humanities seems to agree, although not all of these books are written by Americans, I should say. For example, The Companion to Digital Humanities of 2004, edited by Susan Schreibman, Ray Siemens, and John Unsworth, or Teaching History in the Digital Age in 2013 by Mills Kelly, or The Historian's Macroscope in 2015 by Sean Graham, Ian Milligan, and Scott Weingart. None of them are really where focused. Even more recent work in the broader area of tech and society, we're still seeing this problem. And I ran a book club this term for my master's students in digital humanities, and I chose a series of books that addressed important issues around technology, ethics, and best practices. And the idea was to get them to think carefully about a theme related to technology and encourage them to be the best and most ethical forward-thinking type of practitioner that they could be. Next slide, please. However, without setting out to do so, and entirely due to my own choices for the syllabus, the group ended up reading book after book by Americans writing about tech's impact, tech's impact on America. So some of the examples here are Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Umoja Noble, both of these give lots of examples of algorithmic bias and inappropriate uses of data for surveillance or for policing or even insurance pricing in America. Particularly, they emphasize the impacts of these policies and applications in historically black communities in the United States. Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein's book, Data Feminism, and the edited collection Lean Out by Alyssa Shavinsky both give a wide range of perspectives mostly drawing on American examples and problems with the tech bro culture in Silicon Valley and its effects on America's LGBTQ plus communities, on women and on minoritized groups. Now, these are all great books. I would recommend all of them. We had some really great and really useful conversations about how uh, the ideas in them could help make the students better practitioners. But every time we also had to have a discussion about whether or not the author's viewpoint was relevant in the countries where my students had grown up. And often it wasn't, or it was, but with serious caveats. Next, please. Now we do have a solution for this type of phenomenon um, in digital humanities. And my programming historian colleague, Jennifer Assassi introduced it to me, and it's called the Bender Rule. This is coined by Emily Bender, a linguist who very rightly suggested that it's important that we state the language we're working in, even if it's English, especially if it's English. She argues that we've got to stop letting English be the unspoken default. And I think we need to do better at applying the Bendo, Bender rule geoculturally as well. Maybe we can call it the geobender rule. Next. In the last couple of years, I've started to see quite a lot of GeoBender titles coming out, which I think is really fantastic. For example, we've got Exploring Digital Humanities in India, published in 2020, edited by Maya Dodd and Nidhi Kalra. We've also got a great volume on Digital Humanities in Latin America, edited by Hector Fernandez 
Loest, and Juan Carlos Rodrigo. In 2021, we could add the Digital Black Atlantic, edited by Rupika Rassam and Kelly Baker. Space, it would seem, has very recently started to turn in digital humanities. Next. And I myself have been leading from the front on this important matter by publishing a book called Technology and the Historian, Transformations of the Digital Age. And of course that title completely ignores everything I have just complained about because like so many books by North Americans, its title doesn't mention space at all. And I can honestly say it didn't occur to me that it should until it was too late. Now, despite what I see as a glaring failure on that regard, I did try to weave where throughout the book as best as I could. In particular, I drew on my experiences with Canadian, American, and British higher education systems to try to point out how the past several decades of digital history have been sculpted differently in those three nations. A few people have rightly pointed out that even that tri-national comparison is limited and doesn't reflect the nuance of continental Europe, for example which has its own national traditions of scholarship. And they're right, of course, but I do hope my attempts to contextualize at least the North Atlantic's three largest speaking English countries, sorry, three largest English speaking countries and their histories have proved useful for some. So today I wanted to give a few examples of that, both from the book and uh, that I've just published and from a chapter I've recently co-published with my colleague, Maria Jose Afanador Yach in Colombia just to give some concrete ideas of how where we're studying along the Atlantic Basin has an effect on what we're doing as historians interested in technology. Yeah, thanks. And I'll start with a few things I discovered while writing my book. And to write that book, I spoke to quite a few people who'd been active in, digital hist in the digital and history spaces near to the start of the new millennium, just to get a sense of how they look back on the work that they were doing at the time and how that might compare to what they thought they were trying to do. And I think it's really interesting to talk to people who are reflecting on their professional experiences and to think about what that means for how we can practice our craft today. One of the things I was trying to find out from those interviews was the role of blogging and what it played, um, the role that it played in scholarly communication back around 2005 or so. And as some of you may remember, blogging was the new big thing back then. And for about a decade, it was one of the defining ways that you could find the digital humanist in the room. If they blogged, then they were in. So I spent a lot of time going back through those early blogs, either on the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, or if they were still available, then I looked at them on the open web. And I noticed a lot of things, but one of the most notable ones was that early bloggers in the humanities tended to be North Americans. That shifted slowly over time and there were significant exceptions who were very important in the blogging story. And one of the ones that I would like to note here in the UK was Sharon Howard, who played a very important role in embedding useful blogging in scholarly practice. Some of you might know Sharon's other important work on the Old Bailey Online project. However, the question remained, for me anyway, was why were so many North Americans drawn to early blogging? And when I asked them this, the thing that kept coming up was a desire to feel connected. When I dug a little, I saw what looked to me like something we might call scholarly, scholarly loneliness. Next slide. And of course, we all get lonely, even in big cities like here in London, where I am, perhaps especially in big cities. Uh, but this was a bit different. This was a feeling of intellectual isolation. And I think that was at least partly sculpted by the nature of North American higher education and the geography of North America. Firstly, cities in North America are really spread out, especially once you move west from the areas settled earliest by European colonists. The lack of a really viable passenger train network means that travel between cities is tiring, expensive, and often leads you at an airport uh, miles from the actual city, rather than refreshed at a central train station in the middle of the old town, as we've come to expect in Europe. With a few exceptions, most cities only really have one major university, which I guess you would expect. And of course, there are exceptions to this, such as New York, Boston, and Toronto. But generally speaking, you had scholars studying at the only school in town, hours away from the next nearest university. And because of the way the economics of undergraduate teaching worked, 
Scholars in humanities departments were almost certainly the only one at their university who was interested in their research area, especially if you were the one scholar of, say, Chinese history or European history or Latin American history who had to teach out the courses required to round out the offering. Because of the nature of the job market, it was also quite probable that they weren't living anywhere near their friends or family. They might not even be in the same time zone as their social support network. And in this environment, you might only have seen your academic friends every other year when you both managed to get to the major conferences in the field. That geography and educational context set the scene for loneliness, which some people sought to bridge via virtual, bridge virtually via blogging. One of the scholars I interviewed described reading their friends' blogs like visiting them in their parlor to catch up on their latest ideas. And I thought that was a nice way of presenting what was happening in social terms. Next slide. It also resonated with some of my own early work in digital humanities, which was helping to run the network in Canadian history and environment, or niche, as we called it. And that was a virtual network set, to support, set up to support Canadian environmental historians so they could stay intellectually connected with each other, despite Canada's vast spaces, mostly devoid of people. I took over as their webmaster and project manager in 2008, and we focused a lot on networking on the web, which was fairly new in scholarly terms at the time. We attended and recorded talks at conferences so scholars who couldn't afford to attend could still hear the papers, and we sponsored a, a podcast that's still running today, which is called Nature's Past. We also organized a number of workshops at the major conferences to ensure that scholars in the field had, had meaningful ways to connect at those brief moments when a physical gathering was possible. Technology's role was to help overcome the social and geographic problems of living and working in the North American higher education environment. Next one. Similar matters of geography also came up when I was talking to North American scholars about digitization in the 2000s. This, CD, uh, this included the CD-ROMs that came in the 1990s. And over and over, they told me they got interested in digitization or new media, as they called it, because it gave them opportunities to bring primary sources into the classroom. Without it, the only alternative was either crude photocopies handed out in class or to rely on students to buy a published collection from the campus bookstore that contained a small curated set of primary sources on a given topic. That is assuming a relevant one was available. The vast distances in North America made it virtually impossible for all but the most privileged students to actually visit archives relevant to their studies. Next one, thanks. Now, neither of these problems is as acute in Britain. Here, the geography is compact and well connected via a rail network. I can get to just about any university in the country in a few hours, and they can get to me. At least until a couple of years ago, when the pandemic interrupted things, we did get together quite often. This seminar and the dozens of similar seminars like it here at the Institute of Historical Research in London have been providing an intellectual and social home for scholars for decades. Once a fortnight, for longer than anyone can remember, my friends at the British History in the Long 18th Century Seminar have vigorously debated the scholarly issues of the field before going for beer and pizza. It wasn't even until about 2015 that I started seeing PowerPoint slides at that seminar showing the real zeal for human connection. And we're quite lucky here in London with our access to this Institute of Historical Research. Um, not least because there are so many universities either in the metropolis or near enough for a visit for the evening. However, similar physical intellectual spaces can also be found across this country, and notably in old university towns like Oxford and Cambridge, which too have rich seminar cultures. So you may feel lonely as a British scholar, and I'm sure we all do sometimes, but you aren't geographically isolated in the same way. Neither are your students far away from archives and museums that might enrich their studies by providing access to the primary sources and artifacts of the civilizations they're studying. For those lucky enough to study in London, the long history of the British Empire and its pillaging across the globe means that you can wander into sites like the British Museum to see objects brought here to be shared with the world, but in a way that certainly privileges the needs of we here in London. So perhaps it's no wondering that blogging didn't catch on here quite as fast and that it's instead it really started to gain a foothold here in Britain 
once scholars recognized it was a good way to at least feign on a funding application that one had a solid impact plan for engaging the public. Some of you who were involved in reviewing grant applications in the UK a few years ago may remember that they all seemed to promise a blog. Those blogs, of course, didn't really share the passion of the early North American bloggers who were using their platform to rant, share their feelings and frustrations, and make friends in an otherwise lonely intellectual corner. And perhaps it's no wonder that digitization here wasn't just about the classroom, but that it was driven instead by the Research Excellence Framework, or REF, which made UK-based scholars a little more research-obsessed than their colleagues across the Atlantic, and who wanted to explore the research potential of digital materials as much as they wanted to connect their students with it. In other words, e even though this stuff is all just about how people use technology, how they apply it is linked to where they apply it. Where matters. Geobender rule. Next slide, please. And this is something I've been trying to pay a lot more attention to recently. And it's something that I really need to thank my colleagues on Programming Historian for helping me to really see. And I wanted to, in particular, single out the contributions of Maria Jose and Fanador Yach, Victor Gaiol, and Antonio Rojas Castro, um, who joined the Programming Historian in 2016 with the aim of helping what was at the time an English-only publication focused on digital methods and turning that into a bilingual one that could serve the needs of the world's 400 million Spanish speakers. And I have to say, watching them work was an extraordinary learning experience for me, although I hope it also was for them. And I remember some of their early efforts were really battles around which form of Spanish to use for various words that they were trying to translate from English. And they all had very strong views on those little linguistic distinctions that for them were markers of their local identity in ways that they might not even have been aware previously. So for example, should it be computadora or an ordenador? So the team had to work together to find ways to express ideas clearly, but in a way that acknowledged the plurality of the Spanish language. It also became clear to us in time that people used the programming historian in Espanol in different, sorry, the people using it had different learning needs depending on where they lived. And I remember there was one lesson in particular that taught readers about how to use linked open data in the Europeana collection. And it was actually quite popular in Spain, but it was almost untouched by Latin American readers. Not just because Europeana contained European data, but because linked open humanities data was at the time almost non-existent in Latin America. And that was a European and North American phenomenon that was culturally therefore irrelevant to readers in the Southern Hemisphere. And I'm grateful I was able to explore that idea of relevance in Latin America a bit further when I was approached to write a chapter about teaching history in the digital age. I took the chance to approach my colleague Maria Jose to co-write the piece about some of the historic reasons why that story was different for me teaching in the UK than it was for her teaching in Colombia. Now, I'm not sure how many people got a chance to look at that piece because it's been locked away in an edited collection. So I wanted to share a little bit of the insights of that um, today. And I wanted to acknowledge that I'm also sharing some of Maria Jose's words here. So I wanted to credit her important input in that. For those of you who are interested in tracking this down, the chapter was called The Globally Unequal Promise of Digital Tools for History, UK and Columbia Case Study, and was published in a book called Teaching History for the Contemporary World. Um, and Maria Jose and I, what we did was to think about how our digital history classrooms differed on both sides of the Atlantic, mine in the UK, hers in Columbia. So what I did for my contribution was to share an example of my teaching with some final year undergraduate students and the project work that we did, um, both to build digital and quantitative skills and promote the idea of students as researchers. So what I did was I gave them some early modern English migration data, historical migration data, um, and specifically data outlining the place of origin of thousands of individual students who attended the University of Oxford in the 16th and the 17th century. 
Um, so for those of you who don't know your English history, these are the years that are kind of surrounding the English Civil War. And that is the war where the English king got his head chopped off. And he happened to be hiding out in Oxford for much of that time. So his connection to the area is quite important. And the student's job was to analyze the data that I gave them and look for patterns that could teach us something new and interesting about migration and war. Now, in order to make this viable for the students, I taught them some data management skills and some geo geospatial analysis skills. And I gave them a fairly clean set of historical data that I had pre-processed for them. And the activity actually went really well. Um, and the students identified some really cool, clear patterns that really hadn't been noticed previously by historians. And some of the best essays put forth some compelling arguments for why those changes occurred. And of course, from a teaching perspective, this was a big win for me. But I need to point out that it's no accident that this opportunity took place in Britain and not Colombia because British students study the relics of British culture and British culture has for at least two millennia been fairly obsessed with writing things down and keeping the results of that work. The digital or digitized resources that form the basis of the digital analyses that we do in the 21st century are really just a product of that written tradition from the previous half millennium in the West in particular. And the huge global museum and archival collections that exist in Britain today at institutions such as the British Library or the National Archives are the product of a culture of collecting and organizing, which really took root in the 19th century and which in the 20th century evolved into microfilming and microfiching before becoming digitizing in the 21st. Now, without those earlier stages, then the latter ones might not have followed and we might not be today talking about digital analyses in history. Next slide. So the data that my students were analyzing is a perfect example of this centuries long process. The records had been written down hundreds of years ago by an army of porters fulfilling their daily duties at the front desks of more than a hundred, more than a dozen Oxford colleges and halls. Those workers had patiently recorded what are now mini biographies of more than 60,000 students who came past those desks on their way to a higher education. 500 years later, we're fortunate to still have the fruits of their labor and the little nuggets of information that range from their name to where they came from, who their father was, to when and where they studied, and even sometimes what they went on to become. I've got an example here on the slide behind me of um, the famous philosopher and author of Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes, who uh, his entry tells us was the son of a cleric born at Westport in Wiltshire, Wiltshire in 1588 got a Bachelor of Arts from Magdalen Hall, um, started his studies in 1607, went on to Cambridge, became the famous philosopher and mathematician of Malmesbury, and then died at the age of 91. So from 60,000 entries like this, the students were able to create maps that showed changes in the place of origin of these Oxford students over time. And this went far beyond anything that we had really known about patterns of early modern migration in Britain. But the number of things that had to happen for that to happen is quite frankly remarkable. Not only did the porters need to be part of a tradition where they worked somewhere where the internal management structures required them to keep these written records, but we're fortunate enough that for whatever reason that institution decided to keep those records for 500 years, despite no obvious economic benefit for absorbing the costs of doing so. Then in the 19th century, another man came along named jo Joseph Foster, who devoted years of his life, obviously, sorry, again, with little obvious economic benefit, to verify, collate, alphabetize, transcribe, and publish all those scribbles in the ledgers into a six-volume reference work known as the Alumni Oxonienses. And it's Foster's work that gave us these mini biographies, like the one on the slide. Next, please. More than a century after that, and just after the new millennium, the team behind the newly created British History Online Digital Library identified alumni oxonienses as an important enough work to raise money to include it in their collection in a machine-readable form. This work was funded principally by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which is an American philanthropic organization committed to the arts and humanities and it was one of dozens of similar digitization projects supported by the foundation in the late 1990s and early 2000s. 
The decisions about what to digitize were made largely at the whim of these and similar funding bodies with their representatives sitting in cities such as New York or London, many of whom had Western upbringings that fed their sense of purpose and urgency when deciding whether to fund one project or another. The decisions they made around those board tables of sculpted historical studies a generation later by deciding what would be available as digital data and what would not. So for the students to conduct their research on Oxford students in the 16th century, various people had to create, preserve, reformat, and reformat the records again. This was, a, this was a hidden collaboration over hundreds of years and at each stage costing the better part of a small fortune to enable. This same process happened again and again in countries like Britain. And for those of us who live in these Western countries that benefited from this extraordinary series of unlikely events, it seems an entirely normal progression of a learned society. But this is not normal. This is a culture that honed, the record -keeping, honed its record keeping practices during centuries of building and administrating, administering a global empire. The paper trail of that empire enabled a small group of people in European capitals, such as London, to exert control around the world. And it's left hundreds of kilometers of shelves across Europe that are filled with that administrative paper trail many of which are now ripe for data mining. But what of the ruled rather than the rulers? Next, please. Even in places with long histories of written culture, such as Colombia, they still find themselves hindered in the pursuit of big data analysis by decisions made centuries earlier. The country's colonial past is part of that hindrance. The territories that comprise Colombia today were for over 300 years colonial territories claimed by the Spanish monarchy. The, the Iberian Empire built a complex bureaucratic machine made of papers produced on both sides of the Atlantic. The making of empire created one of the largest colonial archives ever written, which recorded information about former colonies across Latin America and the Philippines. Today, most of that archive sits in Spain at the Archivo de Indias de Sevilla, or AIS. This puts legal title as some of Colombia's most important historical documents with the Spanish state. Even if Colombians did want to digitize and make those resources available for data mining, they don't have the legal means to force Spain's hand. This raises questions about who owns digital data, digital cultural heritage. Colombians wanting to use many of their own colonial era materials are thus at the mercy of the Spanish policies and decisions about digitization, many of which were made in the late 1980s and 1990s by people who did not foresee a future when we would expect to be able to download and, ma and manipulate historical data. A huge number of documents are available online via the AIS, but the infrastructure of the archive cannot at present facilitate complex data analysis. And there's very little Colombians can do unless they have advanced programming skills. The case in regional Colombian archives is even less promising. Many of those archives hold valuable colonial documents, but their situation is precarious because of low budgets, poor enforcement of archival legislation and, conserv and conservation problems, and the lack of catalogs, which has endangered the preservation of many historical archives around the country. Here we have organizations such as the British Library playing a vital role in preservation through their Endangered Archives program, but there's only so much money to go around. Some of the successfully locally led digitization projects, such as Colombia's Neo Granadina, stand out as some shining examples of homegrown initiatives that provide access to important colonial Colombian materials. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there is a long way to go before Colombians have a similar level of digital access to their history as we have here in the UK. And as a result of that and other factors, Colombia and other Latin American countries are doing a different type of digital work, which is connected to their own regional priorities. The country's archivists and librarians have necessarily, for example, a different awareness of where scarce time and resources should be focused to ensure that the greatest overall benefit is achieved. And that benefit isn't always in enabling digital analyses for advanced users. Instead, the focus is often on basic preservation. And why wouldn't it be? 
as the devastating 2018 fire at Rio de Janeiro's National Museum or the 2019 fire at Notre Dame in Paris has showed us. Without robust preservation strategies, all access is lost to both people and machines. Next one, please. Another emphasis Maria Jose noted in the Colombian DH world has been an emphasis on space. Turning to the land is one of the best measurable sources of new data. When I visited Bogota a few years ago to co-lead a digital humanities workshop with Latin Americans, it was clear that a lot of the great work being done was in digital spatial studies. One example that I remember was Natalia Jaramillo, who was a Colombian graduate student at the time in history and geography, using drones to generate a topographic map of the Media Luna or Half Moon Island in Antarctica. Much like Google Earth, she was using software to stitch together hundreds of photographs to produce the first new map of the island in half a century. My colleague Maria Jose's own work on Colombians' transition from colony to republic also takes a geographical approach, seeking to structure geospatial and economic data in small and medium-sized data sets to experiment with modeling of the data in history, of the history of conflict in the region. So big data might not be available for all Colombian scholars, but innovative approaches to what is available is certainly not lacking. And this innovation is happening everywhere. It's not just in Colombia, and it's not just along the Atlantic Basin. But importantly, where it's happening affects what is happening. And it's clear that technology is not location neutral. Instead, its application is a result of history, culture, language, and even boring bureaucratic details of how universities segment the working days of their employees or direct their energies in certain ways. This regionalization in digital humanities is something that I'm excited to see more of, and it's something I've embedded more directly into my own teaching recently. Um, and this past autumn, I taught a new module called Global Digital Humanities for the first time, which one of our audience members was present for, um, and was offered to our digital humanities MA, MSc students. And I tried to take them on a whistle-stop tour of how um, of, of how and why digital humanities is different in different parts of the world. Next one. We've also taken that theme forward in our joint seminar series that I co-run at UCL um, called the Digital Humanities Long View. This is a seminar series that's running right now through the spring on Thursdays. You're very welcome to join us. Um, and it gives space to talk about some of these digital humanities accents that we have in the world. We've got some speakers considering digital humanities context in India, the Caribbean, Central Asia, and a reflection on DH and indigenous knowledge on Turtle Island. And all of that is to say, I hope I've managed to convince you that where matters in DH, whether that's North American colleagues using technology to connect to each other or to bring the archive to their students, whether it's British colleagues trying to improve their department's ref scores with creative use of technology, or whether it's Colombian colleagues making the most of the land around them to build new knowledge and skills. Where affects what? And if the bender rule is important for linguistics, so too is the geobender rule an important piece of context. So please, name your where. Last slide, please, James. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adam, and I'm, and I'm delighted to observe that a number of the people stranded in our previous stream made it across to this one. Great. Um, in plenty of time for us to have a good discussion. Um, I'm going to um, be monitoring the chat on YouTube, so if anyone on our YouTube channel wants to put in a question, please do, and I will ask it to directly to Adam, um, rather than get him to read it off the screen, because that would be weird. Um, I'm also going to ask, first and foremost, everyone in the room has a, a question um, for Adam before I take chair's privilege and then move on to those who are typing. Tess is looking very busy. Do you have a question at the back? Not yet? Go on then. So I'll ask the first question. So I was really, um, I thought there was some really clarifying thoughts in what you said around the notion of where, um, which I suspect are conversations that you and I and other people have had before in sort of like very different ways. Um, but um, 
the way you framed it and the way you talked about the work, particularly Maria, with Maria Jose, I think was, in, was incredibly instructive. Um, one of the things I, I was really curious about was this this slide, which I'm really glad you brought us back to it at the end. Um, and not just the fact that the work that we see here comes from, broadly speaking, digital humanities, but that a number of these, 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 these pieces sort of come from areas outside of what I think of as DH in a way. So the scholars of media studies, scholars of kind of like sort of public technologies, um, and the fact that they are equally works that have had a sort of a wide and great impact in the ways in which a, a number of us talk about technologies and their impacts on our work. Um, but also that they, they clearly are books that have been pushed. So if you take out the DH books here, the rest are actually books which you see very much, I guess, in the popular press as books being reviewed in you know, Sunday magazine supplements and things like that. And they're once again coming from, broadly speaking, um, North American authors. So I wondered if you had any reflections on that, because I you know, I know about your book club and I know you, you ask people to recommend things. And I wonder if all the recommendations came from those spaces. So there's a question there about if you could reflect on that sort of as North American publishing houses, and I guess, and their power in the world. Um, and the second question was about non-DH, actually, because I think I get the sense that when you dig below the level of the book and you look outside of DH for things that are comparable, you do get a better sense of where, potentially in, in places like digital media studies in particular, um, and in areas of critical theory, you probably do get a better sense that people are speaking not from a sort of agnostic kind of, that's the wrong word, a, a non-geographical point of view, but they maybe are speaking from a place. Um. Yeah, so uh, the first question about these books and the, the power of the American presses, I, I think actually, you're right, a lot of these are not books that we would think of as traditionally or only DH books, but if books that are relevant to understanding how technology affects the world. I think there were a couple of presses that I was seeing over and over again um, one of which was MIT Press, which was actually just publishing a lot of really cool books about how technology impacts our society and how our use of it needs to be really thought through more carefully. And MIT is obviously, it's based in the Boston area. It's an American institution. They, they are aware-based as well, um, even though they have international kind of faculty working for them. But I guess it's not surprising that they got a lot of American examples, particularly because um, that's that's where they're based. They're, they would see themselves as international, certainly, but they're, they're international within an American context. So I'm not sure I would blame them for what was produced. Um, I also, I grew up in Canada. So um, one of the things we all learn in Canada is if you want to sell stuff, hide the fact that you're Canadian, pretend you're American. Michael knows this, he's American. Pretend you're American and then Americans will buy it. But as soon as they find out you're not, the market declines. So the fact that these examples are very American, I think plays to that American culture um, and American exceptionalism to a degree. Um, so wonderful, wonderful actress like Ryan Reynolds, of course, is Canadian, but um, he's probably more open about that than a lot of uh, the Canadian actors are. Most of them just try to fly under the radar and not get noticed so that they can pass as Americans. And I think that's that's part of the wider culture as well, and it, it even affects the books that we read here. But I think actually the real problem is that there aren't as many great series that are writing accessible books from other contexts. There's I don't know of a British series that is writing the type of really accessible books like um, Weapons of Math destruction, which is really readable. Anybody can just pick it up and read it. Um, but I, I, I think actually the onus is not on Americans to change, but on other people to start creating materials that we could all read and enjoy. Um, the second question was about at, at, at the article level. It's more obvious. Yeah, well, I think if you push, I guess it's whether you feel if you put what in the work that you've done, if you push a bit outside of sort of DH as branded DH and you look down at the more article level, you do find more of that kind of where. Yeah, and I mean, particularly if you if you look at history work, for example, there's always a where embedded in the history work because it's usually history of somewhere. Um, yeah, and you're right, I did, I chose all books here for this just to kind of, I suppose, have a, 
a space that I was looking at because yeah, you can always find exceptions. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe it's less of a problem at the at the article level, um, and and maybe that's just something we need to blow up a bit into the bigger the bigger stuff, the longer form. Okay, we have questions for the live stream, so I'll go to those next. So Justin, one of our fellow conveners, asks, um, as well as saying thank you, etc. Um, as well as national research structures and infrastructures, you mentioned the influence of teaching in shaping DH in North America. Um, what about elsewhere? What about the marketization of higher education? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I only know the teaching context in a, in a small number of places, so I know what it's like here in Britain. Um, I know what it's like in, or I know what it was like in North America back when I was um, living there and studying there. I'm sure it's evolved as well. Um, I guess the marketization is, even within Britain, is a bit different depending on the university that you work at. So I used to work at a university, which um, I won't name, which was, um, they called it, uh, well, it, it struggled to get students. And the students that it did get were almost all born and raised within 50 miles of the university. And so we created a curriculum that we thought would appeal to that demographic. And I'm now at a university where I think something like 90% of my students are not from Britain. And so I teach them differently with a, a curriculum that I try to help them see how their local circumstances are maybe different than they are here in Britain so that I'm not just teaching them to be a British academic and then sending them back overseas. So yeah, marketization has affected both of those circumstances, but in very, very different ways. Um, and I'm sure that there are similar problems or challenges at every university or every national context as well. Thank you, Adam. I'm, I'm gonna move on to another question in the chat, which is from um, Phil Winterbottom, who also offers their thanks, and then um, wants to follow up on your comments on selection and ownership of digitized um, archive records, and specifically asks about the impacts of paywalls for digitized material and their likely, sort of the likelihood they'll have on future access research around paywalls. And I guess maybe if there's anything, is there anything you can reflect on the work from Maria Jose about thinking about you know, access in Colombia, for example, to materials that we find, although we might moan about a paywall, we're actually quite used to being able to be enabled access through our libraries, so. Actually, yeah, I, I remember talking to her about this and she said that um, back in the kind of 10, 15 years ago, when there were these big, digital resources were coming online, she noted they were all English and they were all Anglo or American. But her university bought them anyway, bought the subscriptions anyways, because it was either have that or have nothing. Mm. And they thought it was more important to have something to be joining the digital age um, than to have something that was necessarily culturally relevant to what they actually needed. So, um, yeah, I guess they kind of felt a little dragged along into the digital age rather than like true partners in in making the selections of, of what they really wanted. And I'm, I hope that's changed somewhat uh, moving forward. I think, I mean, I don't pay a lot of attention to the, um, the digital resources you have to pay subscription fees to, but I think that they have tried to diversify the types of collections that they're now digitizing and selling access to some, the, some of those big commercial partners in particular. Um, but yeah, that, that they're not doing so purely to free that material. They're doing so as part of a business model. So, so I guess as a, as a follow up on that then, so when you're teaching students within digital humanities and you are presenting them with historical materials, reflecting on what you've been doing recently, have you been actively avoiding them paywall materials? Because I mean, for reasons, but have you been trying to always find materials that are openly available to do that work with your students? Then? I do. Um, I think that's partly embedded in my resentment of my undergraduate days when I used to have to go to the bookstore and buy $1,200 $1, worth of books per semester. Um, so I, I've always kind of taken the view of making sure that tuition is the only thing I ask my students to pay for. 
Um, but I'm not sure that I'm not sure I'm usual in that approach. I don't know. Maybe that's more common than I'm aware. Well, I think this this leads into another question we have from Trixie Gad, which the, the question really is: Is digital history democratizing? But the question is reflecting on this idea of paywalls and the fact that you know is digital history a space where the unaffiliated historian can access materials and engage in debate from many different ways? Is is that is that part of this kind of story you're trying to tell? About I guess it is. Yeah, that's thank you. I guess it is democratizing in the sense that even though you can't get access to all of the paywalled stuff there's enough out there that you can operate without having all the paywalls and necessarily the big institutional support. Although once it comes to, I mean, I think if you're trying to do proper research that you want to publish academically, you need a library card at some stage um, because you need access even just to the secondary literature unless you can afford to buy it all yourself. Um, so yeah, within limits, I think a lot of data now you can get, um, sorry, data, digitized sources. I think of that as data. That's that's a whole other thing. But um, digitized sources, you can get quite a lot now openly and you don't need to pay for it necessarily. You might have to sculpt your research questions and ways to avoid it. But I think the opportunities are growing. So yeah, I guess I see that as a step in democratization, if not kind of all the way there. And, and this leads into another question we have in the chat, which is remarkably 2022 moment in which Tessa has is in the room has typed her question. Um, but I'll but you know, but I'll make the segue, um, which which is that um, uh, some of the early promise of academic blogging and digital humanities felt to me like it was about democratization as well, and had a kind of very kind of democratic, we're open kind of vibe. Um, and Tesla's question is around, you know, I guess in that in reflecting back on academic blogging and saying, well, it may have sort of died and withered to some extent among North American DH, but is there still relevance in places beyond North American context of that kind of blogging? Are there places that you've encountered where people are trying to rebuild these blogging communities in other places? And is that democratic potential, I guess, embedded in some of those? Yeah, I guess, I guess blogging was, I mean, blogging was kind of an evolution of, of earlier forms of free writing or protest writing. So. Um, one of the people I interviewed mentioned zines were really important. Um, Michael, you might not remember zines, but this is when people wrote stuff and then used the company photocopier to illegally make lots of copies and share it with their friends back in the 90s. Um, and, and so it was just, it was an evolution of things people were already trying to do. I think there is, there are people are still blogging. I mean, you see Twitter, Twitter now people do threads. So they put the little icon of a, a spool of thread and then they write a blog post in Twitter across like 27 messages. So they're still doing that kind of medium form writing. Um, but I think because the technology has given us new opportunities, it's now easier to put audio online. It's now easier to share video. We're now sharing a live video right now. That wasn't really viable in 2007. So we're seeing more people podcasting and and maybe doing different types of multimedia sharing of ideas that aren't necessarily just blogging, but they're still there. People are TikToking their ideas, right? And that's that's a very similar feel to me than as as the blogging was 15 years ago. It's just a different format. It's an expression space where you can get your feelings out. Thank you. Um, I have no other questions in the chat and I will sort of glance around the room, see if anyone has a question. There's a question at the back. Yeah. Um, sort of thinking about institutional structures, I wonder if you have any thoughts on like the departmentization of DH, the sort of movement to create programs or even department level units where DH scholars can live together, but don't necessarily live alongside the scholars who are doing the analog version of their work, so in history in this case. And if you have any thoughts on that trend and how you see that impacting scholarship or teaching or the formation back then? For the benefit of those on the live stream, just to say the question is about departments and the creation of departments of digital humanities, which maybe are doing comparable things to places, to other departments maybe, but are in separate spaces within institutions. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That's a very good question. Um, so, yeah, I'm currently in a digital humanities, well, I'm in a program that's teaching digital humanities, which is in an information studies department at UCL. Um, previously, I was in a history department, um, 
and there are benefits and downsides to both. I think when you're in the history department, you are much closer to the research questions uh, about history. Um, your colleagues understand them a bit better and um, you've, yeah, you're closer to that subject area for sure. Um, I think even though I'm at a university that has a history department, I don't talk to them that much. I certainly don't feel like I'm part of their community. Um, I don't go to their whatever events or activities that they have because I've got my own somewhere else. So um, I would say that that's kind of a, a, a shame more than anything, but that's also just the way that um, I think the way that universities have structured themselves. I always find it strange that in some universities, a subject like history is in arts and humanities, and in another place, it'll be in a social science department. And, and at UCL, we are separated by not only department, but also faculty. So I'm, I'm a whole faculty away from the historians. And yeah, I think that, that has added a lot of distance for me as a scholar. Um, probably for you as a student in that department, in that program as well, because it's more difficult for us to get you in front of those people if those are the connections that you wanted to make. So yeah, I guess there's lots of problems associated with that segmentation, but I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if that's any different than any kind of interdisciplinary. I mean, Tessa, you said you're in a Dutch, Dutch department and, and um, yeah, might, might have similar kind of views on the segmentation of the university. Yeah, it does create real walls outside that same feeling that you're then more part of the community. Yeah. yeah. But the, the fact that, I mean, the, the growth of departments, at least in the UK, is, is now like a 15-ish year old phenomenon. Um, King's started it off, I think, King's College London and UCL's Centre for Digital Humanities is now, I think, 12 years old. Um, I think, James, you have a centre now as well, don't you, at Southampton? So there's definitely kind of movements towards doing that. And I suppose it's partly an attempt to just get away from the problems that our disciplinary colleagues in history didn't understand or didn't want to understand. And so we've created our own spaces where we can just plug our ears a little bit. But it's a good question, yeah. There's no other questions in the chat, so I'll give people an opportunity to ask, ask any final questions they do have. And I'm going to just ask one final question before anyone sort of chips in there, which is just about you rereading just about you rereading these texts in a way, and particularly going back to 2004, going back to um, you know a, a text which you know increasing you know is still seen as quite a foundational text, digital humanities, um, the companion digital humanities, um, which I've seen cited more often than I expected recently as sort of um, still being a kind of place that people go to for kind of foundational ideas, and is a text among other texts which retell stories that you've spoken about in your book about origin myths and digital humanities. And I wondered if you could just reflect a little bit on, I guess, two things. One is one is the, the awareness of that location, of that original origin story, the kind of the Busa myth and stuff. And I've seen that pop up in spaces I'm really surprised to in terms of the awareness, in terms of why are people over there saying that's their origin myth? Um, and secondly, the origin myth of that book as well, and the kind of the, the place of that within this kind of where conversation. because. That book felt to me like it was trying not to be a North American book, even though it explicitly was, because it was coming from such a small space, I guess, at the time. But you've been rereading them more often, I guess, than I have. So. Yeah, well, I haven't been rereading that one recently, I have to say. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the Robert Busa myth with, within digital humanities is kind of, it's very embedded in European ways of thinking. And I think people, have seen it so many times now that I'm, I wonder if we just don't question it enough. And obviously it was very important to particular type of work, um, but not necessarily all of our work. Um, that I think that book, the awareness of that book and, and the timing of it as well. I mean, I'm thinking back to when I was doing the research for my own book. And I think that was when people started using the term digital humanities rather than humanities computing. And that was kind of a moment of, of switch. And that book probably really helped embed that switch um, as well. Um, 
And before that, of course, there was all the, the humanities computing work, which I think has now been reduced really to, uh, at least people of my generation, to thinking about things like TEI and um, Robert Busa. And that's probably just about all we remember from that time if we didn't live through it. Um, but yeah, yeah, once you tell a story enough times, I suppose people start to believe it. <laughs> well, maybe a comment on religion there. Well, <laughs> well, let's hope that after today, some more of us have got some more weight to put behind why we would maybe stop believing some of those origin stories. Um, there's no more questions in the chat, so all it leaves me really to say is to thank Adam for a really kind of provocative and thoughtful seminar, um, and to thank him for coming down to the IHR and being with us um, today, and, you know, being part of the, the sort of change of the uh, the seminar back into being something which is um, hybrid rather than entirely online. So thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, everyone. It's good to be back in London. Um, one final thought, both for those in the room on the live stream, um, is that we do have another seminar coming up this term on the 10th of May, where Jessica Parr will be speaking. Um, the title of that talk is yet to be decided, but Jessica is a, is a wonderful historian of the Atlantic world and digital history scholar who I know Adam knows as well. So um, we really look forward to that seminar. And that woman will be online because um, Jess, Jess is based in North America, so she won't be coming to the UK for that one. Um, and after that, we will see you all hopefully um, in the autumn once our new program is launched for them as well. So um, thank you, Adam. Thank you all in the room and um, hope you all have a good evening.